right, good morning. Welcome to the Corning Museum of Glass in our amphitheater hot shop and to our live stream. We have um, some visitors watching via the live stream at home or virtually, as well as visitors here at the museum. So this is our You Design It, We Make It. We do a live stream every Wednesday morning from 10 to 12. This week it's a You Design It. So this week we have a an artist, Sharina Bonoon. She's um, given this image of this bluebird on a branch with these beautiful pink flowers. And this is the piece that Chris Rochelle is going to be making today. So we have our gaffer here, Chris Rochelle. How about we give him a big round of applause? <laughs> this is going to be quite the endeavor. He's got lots of uh, details planned for this beautiful bluebird. Um, it looks like he's beginning with a little pink flower. This um, bluebird is sitting on a branch with a couple pink flowers. And so he's going to start to make the flowers. He made one yesterday. Um, given two hours, it's not really quite enough time to make a piece just like this. And so he did do some prep work this morning and yesterday. One more petal he's got to make and then we'll put the flower together. So what he does is he started, starts off with a little bit of glass, applies some pink glass, and he squeezes it flat. Just like a flat flower petal. And then he'll use the small hand torch to heat the surface, the flat surface, and then he's going to use a, just an ordinary butter knife which is one of our favorite tools for glass sculpting, to carve in some detail into the petal. The butter knife is a smaller version of a glass tool we call a tagliole. And so it's just a big, like a big metal spatula. But this is pretty, pretty big, and if he tried to use this to make the little veins, it would cool the glass off and he wouldn't get so many in there. And so by using the thinner, smaller butter knife, he can get a lot of veins in without cooling the glass too much. So it's one of our favorite tools for doing fine detail work on sculpting glass. So Chris is gonna be busily working for the next two hours or so. That's the time we have. It might not take them the whole two hours, but it might. And to make a complicated piece like this, that's how long it'll take. We got lots of things going on at the museum today. We have um, both of our hot shops running this morning. We have our innovations hot shop. So if you wanted to see a traditional vessel being made in about 20 minutes or so, um, that's upstairs on the innovation stage. Like I said, we'll be down here for the next two hours working um, on this bluebird. So you're welcome to check anything out. We also have our flame working demonstration, which starts every hour on the hour. You can check that out as well. So there's lots of glass making happening here at the museum. But this will be a fun demonstration that we don't do every day. Um, we get submissions from uh, visitors to the museum, or people that have been here before. They submit their drawings, and each, every other Wednesday, one of our gaffers, whoever is chosen to, or whoever's um, up next to make the You Design It, We Make It, picks a drawing or a design. So we've made quite a few things. We're gonna continue this program throughout the summer. So there's lots of themes. Every, every week is a theme. This week is Spring Has Sprung. And so it's a great time to make a little bluebird on a branch with some pink flowers. So this is going to be the, the flower's uh, base. He's going to build the petals off of this base. 
right now is just shaping that up. I'm just going to start to heat this with that small hand torch. This is kind of like the torch they use up in the flame working demonstration. They use rods of glass in the flame. Uh, but for glass sculpting, we like to use this torch, this handheld torch, to heat certain small areas. So the base for these flowers is a nice little thin disc. Helen's got all the petals that Chris made today and yesterday on a paddle. And they've been heating up in a garage, which is a hot oven, right around 1,000 degrees. And he's going to start to pick up the petal each one by one, heat up the end of it, and stick it down to the base. Just like that. That's a great shot. We've got... Got someone up in the AV booth. Not sure who it is today, but they're gonna get these wonderful shots. We've got cameras in the ceiling, cameras under marbles, cameras everywhere. And so they're able to capture some really nice detailed shots. Jason is up in the booth today. Maybe. We always give Jason credit, but sometimes it's somebody else. <laughs> and then, of course, we have Amanda on the live stream. She's the moderator for our live streams. And so if you have any questions at home or virtually, um, type them into the comment section, and we will try to get those answered for you. For those of you here at the museum, all you have to do is shout your questions out. We'd be happy to answer those as well. You don't have to go through the moderator. How many of you have seen glass blowing before? A couple of you? Okay. So right now, he's just kind of doing some glass sculpting. We haven't quite done any glass blowing yet, but and I'm not sure if this bird, the bird might be blown. I think the bird will be blown, the body. Um, so we'll do a little bit of glass sculpting, solid sculpting, and a little bit of glass blowing. So there is our design. Of this beautiful blue bird on a branch, some pink flowers. So he's making one of those flowers now. He made one yesterday. Um, Sometimes for these pieces that have these complicated uh, details, it's nice to pre-make one of them because once you see one of them made, you don't really need to see the process again. It takes quite a while. So we pre-make one and we like to we do like to make you know one part of the piece during the live demonstration so you can actually see how that was made instead of just pulling a finished flower from the garage or the oven and then attaching that. So he's, he'll probably use the one he made yesterday and then this one here today. Now hot glass is very sticky, but it's only sticky when it's hot. So he heats the end up. See how it's glowing a little bit and he kind of squishes that right in there. And he's got all the petals on now. Now he's just going to do some fine adjustments. He'll add some yellow um, detail to the center. And I don't know if I introduced Helen. Helen Taylor is going to be helping Chris out as an assistant today. Glass making is very much a team effort. And so for this very complicated piece, um, Helen's going to jump in and help him out and assist. And if they need a little extra help, I can also jump in as well. And I'm sure there's some other glassmakers on site that can come down if we need a little extra help. So this is more like the flame working process. He's got a rod of the yellow glass, and he's going to start to heat the end of it up and start to draw little um, details in the center of the flower. He 
heats up the end and then kind of heats, winds it to a fine thread and then uses the torch to break that fine thread, leaving little dots or little spots on the flower. So if we want to do any fine detail work, this flame working process works really well for that. The only other way to do it here in the hot shop is to do bit work. And it, that tends to be very, it's hard to do very fine detail bit work with a blob of glass from the furnace. And so by using these rods of glass and a small torch, you could actually write words or draw lines, get some really fine detail. ask Helen to give him a little extra heat. Now that he's got all that um, detail in there, he's going to start to shape the flower. So he might kind of squeeze down this line or just give the petals some more shape. Right now they're very flat and rigid. There's a beautiful fl flower. He's probably going to cut in a little line right off the end of the pipe. And that is where he's going to break this free from the punty. So first he preheats it with the small hand torch, just in that one area. Then goes back to the oven to keep everything else nice and warm. So we do a lot of preheating. You kind of squeeze that down, but he's also shaping the flower as well. Kind of curving those petals in. And then you can use these diamond shears to kind of crimp that down even a little further. The smaller and tighter that little line is, the easier that'll break free. So Helen's got the warm paddle out. She's gonna go for another flash. And I'll probably put that flower on the paddle and then put the paddle into the oven called the garage where it will stay nice and warm. that one around a thousand degrees. At a thousand degrees the glass won't melt into a puddle and it won't get too cold where it would crack and break. So we'll use that oven when making all the pieces and parts for this beautiful sculpture. So he was over at this bench because he was using um, glass from the garage and so instead of running back and forth our assistance bench over here. Now he's going to probably work over here at the main bench. So he's going to gather up a little bit of glass from the furnace. He's got a solid rod, so he's going to be making something solid again. That's our clear glass, fresh out of the furnace. It's um, the consistency like honey, it's very soft and gooey, but it's also very sticky. So he's going to roll through some little shards of glass called frit, and it looks like he's chosen a beautiful light tobacco color. We buy our color from a company based out of Germany. They've been making glass color for many years, hundreds of years. This is a really nice caramel color for the branch. So he's got two coats on there. And those little shards of glass stick to the surface. Just like sprinkles on an ice cream cone. Got a question? 
just a little louder if you could. What? There is. There's no, well, the camera's not inside the oven. But they, um, that's the view from inside the oven. The camera sits right behind the oven. But it does look through a special window of glass called fused silica. And that was a type of glass that was developed here in Corning in the 30s. Um, when NASA came to Corning looking for a glass to use for the space shuttle's windshield, that's what they gave them. Um, it has a high melting temperature of over 3,000 degrees, so it won't melt in the back of that 2,100 degree oven, and it won't melt as the shuttle re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. And then more recently, it's very important in our world today because it's the glass that makes up the core, the very core of optical fiber which were also developed here in Corning, but back in the 70s. Three scientists discovered that the fused silica and another high purity glass in combination allowed them to travel the laser light signals through the fused silica really directly and over long, longer distances than the copper wire. So through one optical fiber, as much information can travel as through a bundle of copper wire that's uh, 10,000 um, times as wide. So if you can, if one optical fiber and then a bundle of copper wire, it's much larger. So you can get the uh, information to travel more directly and over longer distances. And those, that technology was developed back in the 70s, right here in Corning. Nobody um, at the time really wanted to invest in optical fiber, because they uh, was kind of they're ahead of their time. But then eventually, now everything goes through optical fibers. So technology that we're using today. So today we're all connected by a single strand of glass, which is pretty cool. So he's applied a little bit of texture to this and then he stretched it out. And right now he's sculpting the branch that this bird will rest on. So we've got another one of those handheld torches over there. You can start to heat just specific spots in this branch and kind of cut little branches out of it. Great to you can tell when the glass starts to become hot because it starts to glow a little bit. So anytime we heat the glass in that area, it looks like we can add a little bit more texture. Just by running the blades of those tweezers through the glass, you can create that nice branch texture. Chris is really good at making all this fine detail work. So he won't, he won't uh, skip on any of the details. Get lots of texture, lots of fine detail. So for those of you who are just joining us, this is Chris Rochelle. He's making a bluebird on a branch. This was a design submitted by um, young artist, Shrina Bono, and I believe she's down in Brooklyn, so she, I don't know if she's watching on, online, or if we know if she's watching online. She, they said, her family said she was going to be watching online. So this is part of a You Design It, We Make It program. And so she designed the drawing, now we are making, or Chris is making, it out of glass. We're going to do this every other Wednesday. 
Um, in between our You Design It, we make a program. We have our Bring the Heat demonstration, which is also a live stream on Wednesday from 10 to 12. And we're going to feature either one of our glass makers here at the museum or a local glass artist. And next week, we have a local glass artist, Eric Hilton, who will be working with one of our glass makers, George Kennard, in a collaborative demonstration. Um, George has been making these blanks of glass, and Eric Hilton takes them and sandblasts the design into the glass. And then we're going to heat those back up into an oven, and George will pick them up once again in the hot shop after they have the, the, the design carved into them and he'll make a large vessel from those. And so that's something that George and Eric Hilton have made in the past and they're gonna demonstrate for a live stream next Wednesday from 10 to 12. So if you're able, you can make it back to the museum. If not, you can always catch us online and then a few weeks after the demonstration, we'll post it to our museum's YouTube channel where you can find all our past live stream demonstrations and lots of videos from us here at the hot glass demonstration in the studio. So limited glass footage that you glass blowing footage, glass um, process footage that you can watch on our channel. So Helen's going to put this branch into the garage where it'll stay nice and warm. And Chris is going to start on the next component of this design, which might be the bluebird. Once he gets all the components made, start sticking everything together. So we're using a soda lime glass today. It's the most common glass in the world. The three main ingredients are silica sand, soda ash, and limestone. And from that, we get our clear molten soda lime glass. It's kept in this furnace. That furnace is kept on 24 hours a day. We never shut that one off. So the light tobacco, we had a question if the, if the light tobacco was a striking color. And I don't think it strikes, so it doesn't change um, color with certain temperatures, but it, it does reduce a little bit. And a reducing color, if you change the flame, you have a really rich flame, it'll bring some of the metals to the surface. And so that light tobacco tends to, if you reduce the surface, it will become kind of shiny or darker, so yeah. Not a striking color, but maybe a reducing color. So he just started a bubble. We have a new system for blowing, which is a blow hose hooked up to some compressed air that's dialed down to about one pound of pressure. He hooks the blow hose up to the end of the pipe, steps on a foot pedal, and starts a little bubble right into the glass. And so we've been using this new system ever since we reopened after um, the shutdown back in last March. We closed the museum for a little while. And when we reopened the museum, um, there was going to be the mask requirement, of course, and even the glass makers were going to have to be required to wear masks while they were working. And so we came up with this new system for blowing. We, we don't have to take the mask off. We don't have to put our mouth on a blow pipe that 12 other people have touched, and so it keeps everybody nice and safe. So we have this tool, and we had a question online about the Sofietta, um, which is that cone-shaped tool.
tool that he was using to blow on the glass. The sofietta can be used to inflate glass. We can use them to inflate glass, we can use them to cool off the glass. And so I think so far he just used it to um, cool off certain areas. So he used it to blow in the glass. But that cone-shaped nozzle, he can pop that cone-shaped nozzle into a hole and inflate the glass once it's been removed from the blowpipe. So it's a, a tool that's used to cool the glass as well as to inflate the glass. And so Sofietta that we're using is hooked up to the compressed air, but there is a tool called Sofietta which your assistant can use. So you'd actually put it up to your mouth and blow through it. It just looks like a tube with a cone on the end. Or there's a bent Sofietta, which the gaffer sitting at the bench, it's a, a bent one, so the tube comes out and then bends over so you can inflate the piece you're making from the bench. Um, all of which we're not using at the moment because of the, the mask system. So we are using the compressed air for the Sofietta as well. Now, if you worked in a private studio with one other assistant, and only one person was putting their mouth on the Sofietta, you could definitely do it that way. But we work on a team of, um, you know, every, any given day there's five of us here and we rotate in and out. So there's about 12 of us, maybe 10 of us at the moment. And we all use the same tools and so we don't want to share tools that we put in our mouth at the moment. So we're just using the compressed air So it looks like he's adding some blue. This is a beautiful blue bird. And so he's got this really beautiful, vibrant lapis blue. You can see it in the tray there. While he's working, this beautiful lapis blue will look cherry red or orange. That's just because the glass will be so hot, but it will cool to this beautiful lapis blue. We want to add different colors to the glass. We add different metal oxides and salts. So to make this blue, they probably add a little bit of cobalt. And to make it opaque, they might add a little fluorine. Copper makes a light blue. Iron makes green. Manganese makes purple. Gold makes one of our most expensive colors, which is a ruby red or that cranberry glass that you see on the bench over there. Those are a collection of um, goblets that Chris Rochelle has made. And some of them, including the air twist stem goblet, we have live stream videos of Chris making that as well. So you can check those out if you're interested. Bring the heat demonstration. But pretty much any metal oxide or salt can be used to change the color of glass. I won't need much. Just the red? We'll do the red first and then a little bit of yellow. So he's got some red and yellow powder. He's been using frit so far, but he's gonna use, start using some powdered color. And um, the powdered color, when you roll through it, it kind of puts up a little dust in the air. And so we're gonna use the powder over here in a powder booth. So Helen just turned that on and she's gonna bring over Chris some little bits of red and yellow for some detail color in the bird. Chris is shaping the glass right in the palm of his hand using the local newspaper. 
fold it up, soaked in water, and it's one of our favorite tools for shaping hot glass because it's nice and soft, nice and flexible. All the other tools are fairly hard and rigid. So now that he has um, got the color on there, he's going to start to shape the body. And you might be able to start to see the bird body emerging from this blob of glass. He's got a little head started. He's got the chest started. So we'll start to see the body of the bird really come to life here in the next couple of minutes. I think they're going to add some wings, different things. He's still got that hooked up to the compressed air system, so every now and then he steps on this foot pedal introduces a little bit of air into the glass um, before this we use this new system you could always tell when the glass maker was inflating the glass because you see somebody blowing through the end of the pipe but now you just have to watch their foot see if they're inflating the glass with their foot Working, he has to maintain temperatures of over a thousand degrees. And so every time he goes back into that oven, he's just going back into the oven to keep the glass nice and hot. Now everything we make, whether it's paperweight or an ornament, a vase, a vase, a bowl, a bluebird, we need a way to remove the glass from the blowpipe. So that, th that third little line that he just put in there, that's where he's going to break that free. I think it'll also become part of the tail. So they're going to start to apply some powder. So they're going to come over here to the powder booth, and he's got the powder in these um, mesh sifters. So it's kind of like sifting um, sugar or powder. but in glass. So he's applying a little bit of the uh, red to the belly. And I'll apply a little bit of the yellow as well. It, the glass color comes in powder form, which is a really nice, fine um, surface quality and then it also comes in something called frit so the back of the blue word the blue that he added that was frit it's little, it makes bigger spots in the glass so it all depends on how you want this color to look you want it to be um, look very kind of smooth and powdery you use that powder form if you want it to look speckly or mottled, you could use the um, frit. If you want a solid coat of color, you could always pick up a chunk of concentrated bar color for a solid look. Gotta melt all that in and get everything running nice and smooth again. You can see the longer he stays in that oven, the more that glass moves around, the softer it becomes. He'll use the newspaper to kind of cool and shape the glass. From where he applied the color, it looks like I was wrong. This is going to be the tail. And this part up here, that's where he's going to break the glass roof of the blowpipe, but that'll also be the top of the bird or the head of the bird. 
just from where he applied that red and yellow color. So this is our fluffy torch. You can see when he uses that rich flame, some of the colors reduce a little bit, like the blue becomes very metallic and dark and shiny. Um, a lot of that will burn away when he goes back into the reheating oven or the glory hole. Even the white reduced a little bit. It's just that really rich propane flame that will bring those metals to the surface. So anytime you reduce the oxygen in the flame of the air, we have forced air um, added to the natural gas in this reheating oven. And so that air um, won't cause the, the flame to be as rich and won't reduce the glass, but this fluffy torch is pure propane, which will um, reduce the color, if it's a reducing color. So he's kind of tapping on that foot pedal. I don't know if you can hear it. But every now and then he taps on that foot pedal to get the glass to flee. Right now he's going to probably squish that tail flat. So he uses this um, hot torch. That one's running on natural gas and oxygen. And it runs probably around 3,000 to 4,000 degrees, so it's really hot. A little torch that allows him to heat just the very um, small section for the tail, which is going to allow him to squeeze it flat. Otherwise, he'd have to stay in this oven, and everything would get hot, and the body would collapse, and the head would collapse. And so just by heating the tail preheating the tail with a torch, he was able to get that much hotter. And so a lot of glass sculptors will use these torches at the bench, use like a flame working torch at the bench. been asked if we're worried about losing our blowing muscles. And I would say no. It's kind of like riding a bike. You never really forget how to ride a bike. It might be a little rusty at first. You haven't rode your bike in a while. But the basic muscle memory is still there. And so... I don't think we're too worried about it. Maybe if you had only tried it once or twice, you might. But Chris has been working with glass for um, a little over 20 years, and Helen, 25 years. And so these guys um, can bounce back and forth, you know, from the automated assistant to the blowing, the mouth blowing process. Just like riding a bike. I think we were all a little worried because when we did shut the museum down and all the studios were closed, unless you had your own studio at home, everything was pretty much closed. There was no place to blow glass. And I think when we all came back after not, a lot of us have been blowing glass constantly and haven't really taken any time off of blowing for an extended period of time. And so a lot of us had not blown glass in, what was it, three months? Four months. Well, we were all able to come back and do exactly what we did before. I think working large got pretty difficult. We uh, hadn't really lifted anything. We did really large bone work in a while. It took some time to get used to things, but it was like we had never stopped. Does he squish the tail? And now we're back.
back in the swing of things. No issues, no problems. And we've all adapted quite well. We've been using this um, new automated assistant or this blowing device since last July. So we're coming up on a close to a year now. And I think the first two weeks it was pretty awkward to watch this blow blast. Um, and even even today, you can see the hose, the hose nozzle has been stretched out. So he steps on that foot pedal, and the hose pops off, and then Helen has to run over and. But it's it's now more just. We know that's going to happen, and we're ready for it. So. But the first two weeks, we were all getting tangled in the hose. The hose was getting wrapped around our legs, wrapped around the bench. But now, at this point, we have lots of experience with the, the hose and. Um, it's kind of like we've been using it for our whole career. So there is a bluebird body, tail. They're gonna, so I think they just, I overheard them say they're gonna attach some wings now. Do you have the wings pre made, Chris? No, I'm just gonna hot salt them. Are you gonna hot salt them on? So he could pre-make the wings and stick them on, but he said he's gonna hot sculpt them on. So we're gonna see them um, bring additive bits for the wing. Looks like he's gonna put a little texture or something in the tail, maybe stretch that out a little bit or shape it up. Chris actually studied sculpture at Hartwick College, Alanoniansa area. Um, not necessarily in glass, but um, he did get an introduction to glass blowing in college. But he was a sculpture major, so he's very good at taking material and creating it into a, an object or a shape. So he got his introduction to glass college, but then worked in a production studio at Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts for a few years. Yeah, our compressed air is not heated, it's just at room temp. Um, the compressed air he was just using to cool the glass is a much higher pressure than what we're using for blowing. When he steps on that foot pedal, if you didn't have the hose attached, you would not hear that hissing sound coming from the, the hose. It's dialed down to about one pound of pressure. I'm not sure. So we're gonna um, say about 30 PSI for the compressed air that he's using to cool the glass, so it's a much higher pressure. If you, um, we use that to inflate the glass, but we just kind of tap it. We don't ever like go on full blast because Chris likes to tell a story. If he was wearing the mic, he'd tell you that after he came back from the shutdown, he, he wanted to see how the new system worked and he turned it way up and he hooked up the blow hose and he stepped on the foot pedal and the bubble got about as big as a beach ball and the glass was so thin it just popped. And so we dialed, he done, then he dialed it right back down, probably dialed it down to about 10, realized it was probably still too much pressure. And we dialed it right back down to about one pound of pressure and that was like the perfect amount of air. So it took a while to figure out the right system. It does have a, the system has a, a few controls on the back of the bench here. And so we can adjust the pressure. We can also adjust the airflow. But it's not as immediate as if we were, if you could adjust as you were blowing. And so there is um, a, little, a little bit of that feedback that you get. If you were to blow through the end of the pipe, you could feel how easy or hard it was going in and you can adjust accordingly. With this one, you kind of have to tap the pedal, kind of see what kind of pressure comes out. So 
So we found that if we just leave it alone at one pound of pressure, that's good, unless we need to increase it to blow into a mold or something and then. But for the most part, we all like to use it at a, a nice one pound pressure level. Whereas the compressed air he's using to cool the glass is a much higher pressure. So he's working on carving in some texture. He's even using some shears to cut the edge, giving this a really feathered look. And then Helen, because they know that applying the color is going to take a while, Helen has already started applying some color to another bit of glass for the wings. So as he's doing that, she'll have the color applied to the wings, and they'll be ready to go when he's finished with the texture. Chris, what was the production shop in Massachusetts that you worked on? Oh, uh, it was called North River Glass. North River Glass. Yeah. What what town was it in? Shelburne Falls. Shelburne Falls. So oh, there's, there's quite a few glass um, shops in yeah, Shelburne, a, Shelburne yeah. Falls. Yeah. Glass Sim uh, Glass Simpson. Main shop Josh right? Simpson. He's a glass artist. He also has his shop in Shelburne Falls. But They're also filming the new season of Dexter. Right okay. Now. Really? Shelburne Falls, yeah. I guess the, um, the show Dexter, they're also filming the most current season of that there in Shelburne Falls. Nice. We have lots of we have some work by Josh Simpson in the museum's collection. The hundredth paperweight to our collection was made by Josh Simpson. It's a hundred pound, they challenged him to make a hundred pound paperweight for the hundredth paperweight to the collection. So it weighs a hundred pounds. There's a nice video of that you can watch. Um, and he has a nice collection of work in our museum shops, which you can find online as well. He makes these little planets, um, little spheres that look like little planets. They're pretty neat. So you can see he's applying some of that feathered texture to the wings as well. So he squeezes them flat, and then kind of cuts and carves into the wings. Helen's starting up on the next wing because like I said, it does take a few minutes to apply this color. You can see she's going back and forth applying the layers. And so um, he asked her to start that a little early just because it will, she, he knows it'll take her a little while to so getting the timing done, it's kind of like working in a kitchen or preparing a meal that you want to come out at different times. You kind of have to know how long it's going to take to apply the color or that much color. Know how long it's going to take you to sculpt this wing. And so glass making is very much about timing, temperature, and of course teamwork. So we always like to talk about the three T's of glass making. Timing, temperature, and teamwork. All really important. So they've got one wing on there. They're going to add another wing. Chris looked over at Helen. She said, I'm ready. He's going to go take a quick flash. And I think when he sits down, he'll probably Give her a head nod or look over and she'll come running over with a hot bit of glass. He'll grab his shears. He's ready with the shears. She comes over. Can't waste any time. If he waits to pick up his shears, the glass that Helen brings over is going to cool off a little bit. He cuts it with straight shears, which cuts it to that point and already gives it that beautiful wing shape. 
and then squeezes the wing flat with those flat crimps and then really quickly gets in there with those shears to cut in a little texture. So wasting no time. That's what's really hard for beginner glassmakers. And we talk about beginner glassmakers and it may sound like we're picking on them, but we know just because we were once beginner glassmakers and you tend to work very slowly or you, you know, you try to find the right tool and by the time you find the right tool, the glass is as hard as these windows, still very hot, but you wouldn't be able to cut or pinch or stretch the glass. So what would, we had another question, what would we do if the bird wing came out a little smaller than we intended? Um, I would say an, an experienced glass maker would look over at the glass that Helen had, and if it didn't look like enough, they would ask her to add a little bit more. If you were an un, a less experienced glass maker and you just took whatever they gave your assistant gave you, you could always add more to it. So you could add the bit on, and if, if one wing was a little smaller, you could always add another bit on. But I think for the most part, an experienced glassmaker and um, of course Chris, he would look over at what Helen was doing, and if it wasn't enough, he would have her grab a little bit more. There's also some little tricks. You could squeeze one a little thinner, you could leave one a little thicker. So there's some things that you can do, but it would all depend on probably what your experience level was. It's really easy to add glass. It's not as easy to take it away in some cases. There he's got two beautiful wings on there for this bluebird. He'll soften some areas. Maybe he's going to cut in a little texture or he's going to texture the glass a little bit. So Helen takes it for a quick heat and then Chris gets his tools ready because he knows as soon as she comes back he's going to have to start heating or shaping the glass. And he's got this little tool, it's called the butter knife. You might have one at home, or a few of them at home. And they're really nice for not only spreading butter but sculpting glass. The nice thin blade doesn't cool the glass as much as some of, like a thicker, um, we have a tool called a taglio, and it's, you know, you wouldn't find one of these in your kitchen at home unless you'd find like a spatula or something, but this is a big thick tool for sculpting big glass. So if you had a big thick piece of glass, you could kind of carve into the glass with this. And um, if you carved into, big thick glass with a butter knife. Sometimes the butter knife would become hot and then it would want to stick to the glass. And so you would need a thicker paddle for shaping, thicker work. But that really fine detail is nice because you can use this little butter knife. See how he just kind of runs the butter knife through there, creating all these little lines, which might be a little hard to see on the screen, but we'll definitely see it in the finished piece. So now they're going to drill a little hole in this bluebird. He's going to, once he removes this from the blow height, blow puck, blow pipe, he's going to probably close off the face. And when air is heated, it expands and 
so we need a little hole for the air to escape so that when he heats the glass, uh oh, <laughs> he's got a tungsten rod that he was using to drill a little hole in the glass with. It looks like it came out of the drill and it's now stuck in the glass. So he's going to get a set of pliers to pull this out because it's probably hot. Hopefully it pops right out of there. So he just pulls it right out. He's got a nice little hole in the body of the bird now. That way when he flips this around and heats it up and closes it off, it's not going to expand in weird areas when he heats the air, heats the glass. So anytime you want to close something off and then reheat it multiple times, you do have to make sure you have a little area for the air to enter and exit so that it doesn't expand. And then of course contract as it cools. It would also, sometimes we forget to put these little holes in. You heat the glass up, the bubble inflates and expands. And then as it starts to cool, it looks like it's gonna go back down to its regular size, but it keeps going and it kind of sucks in. And so, we can prevent that by just popping that little hole in there. So they've got a little branch and a big branch. This bluebird will be sitting on a branch. And so, they're gonna start Maybe putting this all together here. Got your door, Chris? Okay. So this is going to be a clear base. Just gathered a little bit of our clear molten soda lime glass on the end of a blowpipe. He's going to shape this up. And maybe do a little bit of blowing. I'll just put a tiny bubble so it doesn't clog, but... Oh, okay. This is going to be solid, but he said he's just going to put a little tiny bubble in it so the pipe doesn't clog up. The heads of the blowpipes are a little larger than our punties. So sometimes we make solid work on a blowpipe just because it's an easier pipe to gather on and hold a little wider. So here he's going to pop that little bubble by hooking up that blow hose and stepping on that foot pedal. Now he's got just a little pea-sized bubble so that the glass doesn't squish up into the blowpipe because that can clog the blowpipe, rendering it useless. So he's going to let this cool off as we build up the layers of glass, we have to let one layer cool in order to gather another layer. So it goes back in for a second gather to build up more material. If we gather too much, you can always kind of strip it off. You stripped it off into a little bucket of water here, which will break it up into tiny pieces. And that is perfect for throwing right back into the furnace. So we can recycle any clear glass that we take out of the furnace that we don't want to use. So he's shaping this with a wooden scoop tool called a block. These blocks are soaked in water, which allows the hot glass to glide along on a thin layer of steam. These come in all different sizes. They're all pretty much the same shape. They give us sort of that Q-tip shape. But they come in different sizes to make, to shape multiple gathers.
So for those of you who are just joining us, this is Chris Rochelle, and he's making a design that um, a designer submitted. It's a beautiful little bluebird on a branch. And this is a program we call You Design It, We Make It. And so this was designed by Sharina Bono. And Chris Rochelle is the gaffer that's making out our class. And this will go, um, Sharina Bono lives in Brooklyn. So this will be go to Brooklyn when it's finished. And she'll be able to keep this beautiful little sculpture. If you're interested in submitting a design, you can head to our museum's website and the You Design It, We Make It section, and you can submit a drawing. There's themes for every You Design It. I think in April we have a garden party. I think there's a baseball theme. Things that go vroom. Garden party. Yeah, I guess the garden party at the end of April is the last you design it. So if you have drawings, get on the website now and submit your drawings. There's a few more, probably a couple in August, April. The 28th of May and April 12th. Oh, April 12th and April 28th are the last two. So submit those drawings for your chance to participate in the You Design It, We Make It program. So here he's kind of spun that glass out, that thick glass into a thick pancake disc. So he probably used a little bit of heat and centrifugal force, but he also is using that newspaper pad to squeeze the glass out nice and thin. The center you see there is the blowpipe. That area that's glowing orange is the, seeing that hot metal through the clear glass. Helen's gonna use a wooden board to make sure this stays nice and flat, but this will become the base. You can see the wooden board catches right on fire. That glass doesn't look too hot, but as soon as you use any of the wooden tools, you can see just how hot it is. This is newspaper, but it's soaked in water, so that one won't catch on fire. If it did, it would want to stick to the glass. So he'll keep it soaked in water so that glass glides along a thin layer of steam and carbon. So this will be a nice base for this piece. So we are just about an hour into this demonstration, which leaves us an hour to finish it up. He's got the bluebird made, he has the two pink flowers made, the branches as well. And so we'll start to put everything together. And just add some, I think he still has to add the beak and stuff to the bird the flowers to the branch. So everything's gonna start to be put together at this point. So that's that compressed air that he's using to cool the glass. He blows on it not to inflate it, but to cool it off so it settles up and keeps that shape. Alright, 
So, Helen's going to take over. She's going to heat the glass, and Chris is going to start to pull some things out of the garage. He's got some branches. So before he pulls them out of the garage, the garage is kept around 1,000 degrees, and it has a hot side and a cold side. And so before he pulls it out of the garage and into the 2,000 degree oven, he's got to warm it up on the hot side of the garage first. Because if we heat up glass too quickly, if we heat up our glass too quickly, our soda lime glass, it will crack and break. So we have to heat it up slowly and then introduce it into the really hot um, oven. So he's heating it up on the hot side where the flame is, and then you're going to see him come out of there and quickly get into this reheating oven. Helen is just going to maintain the temperature on the base not getting it so that it moves around a little bit, but just heating it enough that it stays nice and warm. So Chris has a branch. He's going to measure the size. sure that the branch is going to fit nicely on the base. He's going to start to heat this up probably and then stick the two together. Any questions so far? So he heats just the tip, so it becomes nice and hot, nice and sticky. So for this piece, because it, um, Chris isn't the designer, um, we have this drawing that he's working off of. And so it's the blue bird on a branch here. And from that, Chris has gone over this in his, his head a few times, um, trying to decide how he's going to put everything together. Um, make a tiny little mark so you can see it. Chris, did you re-sketch this at all? No, so he didn't re-sketch it at all. He's kind of just, he makes the branch. He can kind of remember how big it was. Um, he knows how big his base needs to be and then proportionally the, um, the bird as well. And so if it's a piece that we're not really sure that we can make easily, he might have made it a few times in clear first. I'm gonna grab that pipe from you, Chris. And so, he's probably thought about it. He's kind of sketched it in his mind, I'm sure, a few times. But you could sketch something a million times on paper and it's still not going to translate to this process. Um, when it, Sometimes when I make a sculpture, like this bluebird, it's a pretty simple shape. It's just like a teardrop shape. And that's, but if you were going to make, like a, a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, I made a camel and I kind of had to sketch out the shapes to make the body. So a lot of the times, if I'm going to sketch out a sculpture, I would sketch out the steps it might take to get there instead of sketching out the actual piece. Like first you'd make this shape, then you'd add the head. Because um, 
For this piece, we haven't really flipped anything around yet, but sometimes you have to flip things around a few times on something called a punty. And so you have to design it in a way that it can be flipped around and it has to be removed from the blowpipe and that has to be added. So the, we had another question um, from home and it was, how do you know if your glass is hot when you're either using the furnace or the torch? And so we don't use any sort of thermometer or instrument to tell us that the glass is ready, but you can see when he heats the glass with the torch here, see how it glows a little bit? That is a good indication to us that the glass is hot. When it's inside the oven, everything looks orange or hot. Um, and so what we're, we're going to look for inside the oven is a little bit of movement. And so we look for color. And then inside this oven, we're looking for that movement. We can kind of feel the movement through the end of the pipe as well. So that are the, that's the two things we mainly look for. And a lot of that just comes with experience. I was trying to come up with a nice analogy that would be a little easier to understand. And the only thing I could come up with last week was making a grilled cheese. So you, <laughs> how do you know when the grilled cheese is done? Yep, you look at it, you see if the cheese has started to melt, you lift it up, see how brown it is. It's not brown enough, you leave it a little on a little longer. If the cheese still kind of looks cold and not melty, you gotta leave it on the heat a little longer. So I don't know if I was if it was around lunchtime like it is now and I just got hungry or if that was the best analogy that I could come up with. <laughs> I was also trying to explain it to someone who probably wasn't old enough to make a grilled cheese, so that didn't really help either. Way too late. Yeah, and yeah, Amanda was just saying it's also a learning experience. If you leave the grilled cheese on a little too long, you can't go back. Same thing with the glass. And so a lot of beginner glass makers they'll stay in the oven a little too long and then the whole thing will just collapse and fold in on itself. And so a lot of glass making is just like that, a learning experience, and you kind of have to you get the feel for it, yep. You know what heat you need how long to stay in there, and what it looks like right before it's ready to burn or collapse in on itself. Like I said, that looks pretty good. So it's got the branch on there. One thing Chris does have to do for a, a design like this is decide how it's going to be displayed. Sometimes the designer will explain that in the drawing or the sketch. But for this piece, um, going from this two-dimensional drawing of this bluebird, he has to now turn this into a three-dimensional um, design. So he's designed it so the branch sits on this base. So usually if that's not explained to us in the design, that stuff will take creative freedom for that. So now he's got a rod of black glass and he's gonna start to draw the feet on to the branch. And then eventually he'll add the legs as well. I have a feeling this is going to be a very delicate glass sculpture.
Yeah, so that's the hardest thing for beginners. I'm just kind of watching Helen. She's just kind of looking in there and watching the glass, but a beginner will ask the whoever's teaching them, how long do I stay in here? And I think they want a number and they want to count, but it really, it just, it's different every time. Um, a short flash heat is different for if the glass has been out of the oven for quite a while, you need to take a longer flash. If it just needs a little bit, if you just came out of the oven and you just want to go back in for a short period of time, you're just going for a little bit. A lot of times with those short, like this short flash sheets that they're doing now, Helen doesn't want to come out of the oven with any movement. She wants it to be hot enough that it won't crack or break, but cold enough that it's not going to move when he um, starts to add the feet. And so it's a really fine, delicate balance between the heats that they're going to be taking and the time they spent out of the oven. And that's why it's nice to have an experienced glassmaker. Helen's been working with glass for 25 years, and so Chris doesn't really have to explain to her how long to stay in the oven or every time. He might say, take that for a short flash or stay in the heat a little longer every now and then, but for the most part, he doesn't really have to tell her what to do. She already knows. Ever, any of you ever seen the show on Netflix, Blown Away? Yep. So that's the reality um, glass blowing competition that's currently on Netflix. We had a little part to play in that. We went up for the final challenge. The last two contestants have to put together a gallery's worth of work. And so they sent six experienced glass makers up three to assist one contestant and three to co assist the, the uh, second contestant. But throughout the competition, they get one assistant. And those assistants um, are from an art school up in the Toronto area called Sheridan College. And they sometimes had a different assistant every time, and it was somebody they never worked with before. And so there was a lot more communication happening. Chris and Helen have worked together for probably a little over 10 years now. And when you work with somebody that long, You kind of know what they want and how they want it. So on the, the show, there's a lot more communication, a lot more kind of running around. Also, Chris is not being sent home. There's no chance that he's going to be sent home and not asked to come back tomorrow if he doesn't make the winning piece today. So. Even if this goes terribly wrong, which it won't, um, he'll still come back tomorrow and he'll just remake the piece. But if it's a competition, the stakes are a little higher. And so that's why you see them running to the annealer. You see glass crashing on the floor. A lot more action, I guess you would say. Our glassmakers are all pretty calm and cool most of the time. And that's just because this isn't a competition, it's a demonstration, but sometimes things get a little, the tension picks up a little bit and you'll start to see it. But for this piece, I think you'll see Chris, everything will go pretty easy. So he's kind of just adjusting the shapes here. 
Now, if we told him that his job was dependent on the success of this piece, then you'd see him sweating a little bit, maybe. <laughs> a little more freaked out. Or if there was a $60,000 prize package at stake. That might change things as well. So they were just letting that cool off. Now he's going to start to add the legs here. That second season of that show just came out a few months ago, and um, we have one piece from every contestant in a small exhibition at the top of the gallery here on the area of the museum we call the West Bridge, and so you can check that out. There's no spoilers, or they're not going to tell you who who won the competition or anything, but there will be one piece from different episodes. So it's a fun little display. You can see some of the pieces. So if you haven't seen the show, it's not going to let you know, give you any spoilers or anything. And as part of that $60,000 prize package, one of the um, parts of that is a residency here at the museum. And so COVID kind of put that on hold for a while, but as soon as it's safe to do so, the winner will come here to the museum for a week-long residency. And we'll probably do some live stream events for that as well. So he's got the legs on there. Now this is gonna be really tricky because those are really thin, spindly legs and so they're gonna heat up the fastest. They're also black glass, which absorbs the heat more than any other color, which makes it the softest, one of the softest colors that we use. And so Chris has got quite the challenge here to keep these Nice and straight. Looks like he's gonna cut off a little bit. He heats it just in that middle section, then cuts it off. And Helen's gonna start to heat up the body of the bird. So again, heating the bird on the warmer side of the garage before she comes out and into the reheating of it. Chris makes sure the base is nice and straight. We've got Jeff Mack, he's come out to check on the team, see if we need any help, or just see what's going on. <laughs> yeah, so, so black being one of the, the softer colors because it absorbs a lot of the heat, um, the white glass is, I don't, I'm not sure if it's more fragile, but it is more stiff because it reflects the heat. And so adding different colors together, the heat is um, changing it a little bit. 
So they're kind of deciding how they're going. This is kind of like a dry run or a dress rehearsal to see how they're going to attach this bird. So Helen's got to bring the bird over in such a way. And like right now, Chris is the only one that knows how he's going to attach this. And so they, he kind of just tells He um, has her come over and just check it so they can see where this needs to be positioned. So these pipes do get hot. Helen's going to cool this pipe off, and I'm just holding this towel here so that if any cold water splashes up on the bird, it doesn't crack the bird. All right, Helen, let's trade. Give a flash on that over here, please, and then trade me. Because that's been in the garage for so long, the metal has gotten quite hot. She is wearing a glove, which is going to help her keep her hands cool, which she's now going to take off because it might be hard to turn the pipe. She'll bring it over. They're going to trade off. This is one of those steps where everything's pretty tense. This is not going to be an easy process like putting the stick on was a little easier. This is going to be a little trickier. So she's going to bring the glass over at like a 45 degree angle. He's going to stick it on there, attach it. See, part of the design is using like the tail as like the third leg of the tripod, which is a nice way to do it because those spindly legs would be very fragile to hold this whole bird up. Now they've got to break it free with a few drops of cold water and a light tap. Whoop, pops right off. How about a big round of applause? Wow. It looks like they just tapped it, but I was like, I know all the things that can go wrong at that moment. I got a little nervous. I was surprised they just tapped it right off. Got the bird on the branch. No problem. Cool as a cucumber. Yeah. Let's just make sure everything's running nice and straight. And then he will start to work on the head. Probably add a beak, some eyes, the flowers. They're all pre made, so he's just going to start to stick them on. But he's got to make sure all these connections are really strong. See, Jeff's going to help out because Helen's going to be running back and forth with all the other different things. And so Jeff was kind of probably watching from his office and saw that looks like they need an extra hand. So he came running out. The more difficult a piece is to make, the more glass makers it's nice to have on the team. start to heat the head. It's probably going to pull all that color together and then sculpt the beak and stuff. They just said it's a stiff white. So they've put a lot of heat on this so far. They've used the torch, they've used the glory hole. But the glass still doesn't want to move. So 
So right now they're using the fluffy torch on the moil, which is the glass holding the pipe, and that hot torch on the head as a preheat. There's that nice glow. So he's going to pull all that color together. He'll cut that free. Shape the top of the head. Oh, he's really coming to life. You can almost hear him chirping. <laughs> He's heating up the Sofietta because he's going to touch the hot glass with it. Looks like he's going to try to puff up the head. Remember that little hole he put in there? If he touches the cold glass with, um, touches the hot glass with a cold metal tool, it could crack the glass. So sometimes we want the metal tools to be a little warm or have a little heat on them so that we don't crack the glass when we touch it. Looks like he's gonna try that again. So that little hole that he poked earlier, that's the only hole in this bird. So if he can get the air to go through the hole and the head is hot enough, he can puff up the top of the head. But it is a tricky maneuver. Looks like it's going. gets in there with those tweezers to kind of push it around a little bit. hot torch to soften the face. And he's probably going to draw on some little eyes now. So he's got that little rod of black glass. going to shape the face up a little bit, make a little indentation where he wants to put those eyes with the tweezers. And then he asked Helen to start up the bit for the beak. And so we're going to add a black beak to this blue bird. So Helen's applying a couple rolls of that nice black frit. Chris is heating up the little um, rod of glass for the little beady eyes. So he's going to just draw two little dots on there. So he'll use this hot torch to heat that up. Sticks it on there. So again, using that flame working process to make the really fine detail. <clears throat> I 
There's a nice shot of the face. Now that he's got the eyes on there, he'll add the beak, which Helen will bring over in the form of a hot bit, which he'll probably cut to a point. So he'll use a set of straight shears to make this diagonal cut, which will shape the beak. So even the shears we use um, will determine the shape. So he's now picked up the straight shears and he cuts it to a point. And now we've got a beautiful little beak. Boy, those legs, those poor legs. He's been drinking. Drinking from the wrong bird bath. The neighborhood cat got at him. Yeah. The bird is finished for the most part, but remember we still have those beautiful pink flowers to add to the branch. There's the drawing. So Chris is going to heat up those legs a little bit and move those around. We still doing all right on questions? We're pretty close to finishing this up. He's just going to stick those two little flowers on. This beautiful bluebird sculpture will be finished. So again, you can tune in next week for our Bring the Heat demonstration with Eric Hilton and George Kenner from 10 to 12. Same time, same place. Next Wednesday. We're going to add a little bit to the top of the head. Yeah, that's funny. It's nice and toasty. Jeff is just keeping the bird warm and Helen's really roasting this bit so it gets nice and hot and gooey. They're gonna add a little bit of extra glass to the top of the head here for some feathers. And he's gonna just kind of push it down. So 
Helen's gonna pick up those flowers which have been keeping nice and warm in the garage. She's picked them up on a metal paddle. She'll bring them over, he'll heat them up, stick them together. working outside the bench now. He's kind of stepped outside. He's heating it with a torch and using that butter knife to push and create some nice detail texture in the glass. That allows him to get a little closer without kind of leaning all over to the side. flowers and so Helen will bring one out on the tray. She brings it over. He's starting to heat the, the one side. Sticks it right onto the branch and Helen's going to get the next one ready to go. Beautiful. Look at that. Isn't that pretty? Perfect for a spring has sprung theme. We've got one more pink flower. For the other side. And then the final step for this glass sculpture is a slow cooling process. So once they're finished with this, it will go into this oven. This oven is kept at 905 degrees. The glass will stay in there, coming down to room temperature very slowly overnight. What do you think? Beautiful. You have one more? One more. I mean, oh, they've got another flower. I didn't realize they had more than two. So once he gets them on there, if he heats them up, he can adjust them and okay, make sure they're right where he wants them. So he lets Helen know he's ready for the next one. Like I said, it goes back to the three T's, the timing, temperature, and teamwork. Everything has to be at the right time, temperature, and of course, as you can see here, the three of them, teamwork is really important. You can blow a glass by yourself. It's probably a lot more work, a little more difficult. And it sticks that right on there. A beautiful glass sculpture. Now he's probably going to even out those temperatures, make sure that the he's got to break the glass off of the, the pipe. 
And so on the area that he's going to break the glass, he's probably going to add a little extra heat so that it doesn't break the whole piece. It just breaks on the thin, weak line. Helen's going to put on some PPE, some personal protective equipment. She's got a sweatshirt to protect her bare arms from the 910 degree oven. A face shield to protect her face and hair so she doesn't come out of there with a, some fresh bangs, fresh burned bangs, and some Kevlar gloves to hold this hot sculpture. Applying a little heat to the area that he's going to break the glass. If that is too cold, the whole base could break. We always want to add a little heat to the area that we're going to create the thermal stress on. Helen's going to get under it with the gloves, just in case it pops off early. It's a nice detailed shot of those flowers. A few drops of cold water and the lightest tap, watch this, pops right off. They'll remove the sharp edge because they did break the glass. It does break like cold glass and a sharp edge. And so they'll fire polish that sharp edge and then Helen will Brush this quickly and carefully into our 21 or our 900 degree oven, where this will stay overnight. Coming down to room temperature very slowly. A beautiful sculpture. That's Chris Rochelle, everyone. Helen Tegler helping him out. Jeff Mack, and of course our designer, Sharina Mono. A beautiful little drawing. A beautiful glass sculpture. That does conclude our new design.